Okay, so we're going to begin if you're just joining us now. My name is Beth Fisher Yoshida, and I am the program director of the Masters in Negotiation and Conflict Resolution at Columbia University. And every month I host a webinar, and we'll talk about the guests in a minute, who I'm excited to have a conversation with today, but to share with you some upcoming events, in case you don't know, then uh, we have an information session on the 27th for prospective students. It will be held virtually. So please uh, look at that if you're interested in learning more about the program. And then related to that, if you stay on at the end of this webinar, David Taylor Tumilty will be coming on and talking about how you might apply if that's something of interest to you. Then we are helping to sponsor an event on April 3rd, which will be in person on Columbia campus. And it's with a broadcaster, Lucy Cook, who has some really interesting comments and observations on life, which would be fun. And then um, on April 17th, we also, a virtual event is Future Proof Embracing the Generational Wave. On April, oops, I went back. Yeah, on April 18th, we have uh, another webinar and uh, with Flynn Coleman, I'll be talking with her and it's the human algorithm and really looking at the role of technology and human rights. In um, spring, we have our, actually, we have three times a year, the uh, capstone presentations. Capstones are sort of the, um, the big event that happens in the program where students do a wonderful applied conflict analysis to a particular topic, and they have a chance to present their findings, and they're all super interesting and innovative, and I think it's something you might want to join us with. That's on campus. And then in May, we do have another webinar, which is Imaging Peace Through Photography with uh, Dr. Tiffany Ferry, and that's going to be virtual as well. So um, maybe we can put something in the chat afterwards or the, uh, for you to link to this. Otherwise, uh, you can look at the barcode there, the, the code, and um, you can, all, the QR code, and you can also look at the NECR website as well. So enough about that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to introduce my guest here today, which is Dr. Aldo Civico. And I'll say a little bit about Aldo's background, but really, whatever I say is not going to do justice, because Aldo is a very interesting, eclectic person, kind of like a Renaissance man, and so apropos, since he does originate from Italy. So I know Aldo these days as a person who works globally, as a coach, as a facilitator, an instructor, consultant, there's lots of different roles there. He started as a journalist, and I'm sure that somewhere today in our conversation, we'll talk about his roots, his origins, and how he got to where he is today. But he has a very unique take on things. And I have to say that being an educator, kind of like my whole life, even though I didn't plan on that necessarily, that whatever discipline you study, one of the things that discipline does is it really does shape your mindset and give you a lens and a framework of how to look at the world. So everything else in the world comes through that lens. And I'm just wondering that um, the lens of journalism, how has that shaped how Aldo approaches different things? And maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that. So this is going to be very conversational. And what I'd like you to uh, think about also is, do you have any questions or comments? And if you do, please feel free to write them in the Q&A. And then uh, at some point during the webinar, definitely towards the end, we will look at your questions and comments and integrate that into our conversation. So without further ado, I'm going to ask Aldo to uh, unmute and then to say what he'd like to say, and we can just start. Aldo, welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Beth, for the invitation. It's great to be here and greetings also to everyone who is connected. Uh, I'm sure we will have an interesting conversation as usually you and I, when we get together, actually have. <laughs> so. And we meander, right? So we may start with a certain point and then Correct. suddenly Correct. end up over there and we Correct. sometimes pull it back and sometimes not. So, uh, you know, the title was the massive transformation. Is that right? Yeah. So what is that like? So tell us a little bit about what your work is, your approach. How you'd like yeah. To describe so it. so let, let's start with the with the title um, of around which we wanted to frame the conversation, which is massive transformative purpose. And this is really a, an expression that comes from the world of innovation. You know, it, it's something that 
Peter Diamantis and his people in Silicon Valley, Singularity University have crafted. And really the idea is for, especially for technology startups, uh, to think about solutions that are innovative and disruptive and actually resolve a big problems that we have in the world, right? So the idea is that today, if you have a massive transformative purpose in this world that is so exponential, disruptive and accelerating, you have a North Star which you can uh, follow. You know, the technology, the solutions might change, but if you know what you want to contribute to, that's going to guide your decisions and, and also your quality decisions. Uh, so I always like to make the example of, of a guy very, very quickly that, that after a trip to, to Haiti and seeing that people were still living in a poor housing after 10 plus years of earthquake, uh, decided initially to do things traditional, which is opening an NGO, collecting some money, bringing you know the money and the material to build houses over to Haiti, and being able to build houses for 15 families. But then he realized that the housing uh, situation is a housing, the poor housing, uh, and affordable houses is really a world crisis, which involves millions and millions of people. And that actually we will not be able to resolve that uh, crisis if we use the knowledge that we have today and if we build houses as we are just there is just not time enough and material enough and resources enough and money enough so he you know came up with the idea and say well uh, is there any chance that there are 3d uh, lasers that can build in cement uh, houses and when he asked that questions and he asked it to a group of engineers of another company, actually there was no such thing. We were, you know, the first laser printers and 3Ds, but not to build houses. But the purpose, which was to resolve that massive purpose, right? To resolve the housing crisis in the world really also uh, sparked the idea of what do we need to know? What knowledge do we need to create so that we finally can have that printer, right? So the massive transformative purpose, it's massive because it doesn't just uh, uh, belong to to your family circles or circles of friends. Uh, it's transformative because, well, like the example that I did, right? If we are able to to have those uh, printers, we, we, we can build a lot of homes at a cheaper cost uh, around the world. And in fact, uh, just to finish the story, they were able to build that uh, um that that printer and now in 24 hours one of those printer builds two homes in in, in mm -hmm. cement right so knowledge comes after the vision basically today thanks to innovation thanks to technology so when i started for a variety of reasons digging into this world and 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 you know the world massive the world purpose and transformative were certainly sounding resounding with uh with me i said why we don't transfer this also to other areas uh, of our lives. You know, why does that have to do only with technology and innovation uh, or entrepreneurship? And why doesn't that have to actually to do with education? Why it doesn't have to do also with politics and, and also with our personal life? Since we are all in times where the ambiguity, the anxiety and the uncertainty and the no linearity of our world is actually creating a lot of dynamics that are completely new to which we our lives are exposed, right? So that's that's a little bit the concept and how today I'm researching and working on actually applying uh, to it. And ju just to finish this, this part, I, I was in a meeting, I'm spearheading right now, uh, I, I'm in, sitting in Medellin right now, and I'm spearheading a meeting with different leaders from different sectors, right? The social sectors, uh, some of whom you know uh, uh, as well, uh, but also from this technology, high innovation uh, technology, but also experts in narrow marketing, but also entrepreneurs. And, and we are together uh, uh, and actually thinking of how can we use technology and everything we know about even neuroscience to accelerate transformation? You know, how, how can you uh, there are, uh, as you know, there were wonderful processes in arts and culture uh, that have been a sign of resilience for the city that has been, you know, marked by violence for so many years. But how can we actually accelerate a, a more massive change of, of 
of behavior in in, in people, right? And and so the, the but but the attempt is really to bring all the knowledge that and the methodologies that we are using mainly today in the world of technology and science and, tech, and innovation into the world of actually uh, social transformation, peace building, um, and 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 so on. Great. So then talking about that sounds like it's it's super exciting and creative, but I think it's also scary for some people. What, you know, after something's done, we can say, oh, yeah, that makes so much sense and it worked out so well. But what is it that people need to be able to do or to have some kind of ability, some kind of skill set to be able to let go of their conventional way of thinking and be able to take on a new way? And then what do you do in your work with people to help them get there? So, well, you know, think about, uh, and what you say is, is perfectly right, and, and it's difficult for everyone, even in business, you know. Uh, our generation was very familiar with Kodak and with the Kodak film, right? And, and we were taking photos with Kodak films, but then the digital transformation came and digital photography came. And uh, though Kodak had invented the first digital camera, a, a group, you know, they never took that seriously because they were successful in the conventional way of doing things, uh, but they collapsed, right? And it's actually really uh, interesting that the year that Instagram sold itself to Facebook back then, uh, which if I remember correctly was 2013, uh, that was the same year that Kodak uh, filed for, uh, you know, uh, chapter 11, right? So so just to say how that, I, I don't think it's it's a matter of saying, do I want to change or not? Do I like this or not? I think that today the question is, if you want to stay relevant, you really need to adapt. And I think that the big challenge that we are facing today, and it's not only a challenge of skills, that of course you need to 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 learn, right? It is mostly a challenge of mindset, and and uh, and the big difference I think that we have today is that in the past, up to maybe a couple of years ago, we were using technology to support what we were doing, right? So, uh, well, you know, COVID comes, let's do Zoom, and so we can have classrooms and and and, and teaching, right? So we were using technology, but basically to help us doing what we were already doing, right? Making it better, making it more efficient, making it faster. But it was the technology adapting to our life. Now with artificial intelligence, quantum computers, and you know, learning machines and, and everything else that is coming around that, it will be really vice versa. Technology will be much, much ahead of human adaptability and, and we will be much, much, much slower as human beings to adapt to technological innovation. And, uh, and, and so our business models and our lifestyles will have to adapt more and more to technology and, and not vice versa. And that's a huge change in mentality. It's a huge change in mindset. And the only way we can try to close that gap between technology advancement and human adaptability, and if you want human uh, 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 advancement, the gap will be all, always there. What we can hope is that trying to make it closer. That ha that means being highly flexible and highly adaptable, uh, and uh, you know making education and learning a permanent effort, not a matter of a master of two years for semesters. You know you get your diploma, you have your nice ceremony, and that's it for the rest of your life. Like it was certainly for the generation of my. My, my parents, today you start the university on a first at college first semester. When you get out, the risk is really that everything you learned is obsolete because the world in the meantime went so fast ahead, which doesn't mean you, know, you don't go to the university. That means that you need to make the commitment to study and to educate yourself in a permanent way, just in order to remain to stay not ahead of the curve, that, that's almost not impossible, but at least not left behind completely and stay, and stay relevant. That's why the massive uh, transformative purpose becomes important. Because if you have that, then you know who do you want to become as, a, as an individual. You want to know what your values is. You know what your identity is going to be. And, and, and that is going to guide you. Everything else you will be able to adapt, you know, because there will be new technology and new knowledge and new ways of doing it. This is really the 
era of knowledge, right? Where where knowledge is is the big uh, treasure, uh, and 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 it's also available. Knowledge is not anymore hold in uh, the clusters of universities. Knowledge today is spread out. It's out in the cities. It's out in you know when you and I travel to to the neighborhoods of of Medellin, we see how much knowledge is there and how much advanced are certain people in using certain technology to make a living uh, that, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we wouldn't able to, to do certain things that they do, uh, but they do because they are there, they're on the cutting edge of where transformation and change innovation is happening, right? Like Otto Sharma says, innovation happens at the periphery of our society, but also at the periphery of our, of our knowledge, right? So that's where uh, I, I think our life is going to be played out and 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 we need to be ready. So the yeah. skills, I, you know, uh, first of all, you know, I will, the question of purpose is not just because it's in fashion, you know, the ikigai and all of that. No, thinking in terms of what is the ultimate contribution that I want to give to the world? You know, what is it that I want to spend my life on? What is the problem that I really would like to see resolved? That's going to be key because that's going to help you to select who do you want to have conversations with, what do you want to study, with whom do you want to work together, and, and how you're going to spend your life. And then you will adapt in the ways in which you will contribute to that purpose. But you have you have a North uh, Star, right, that, that, you can, that you can follow. And then you need to, uh, uh, therefore, adapt your uh, mindset. So the vision, you need to have an ambition, you know, something that really... Uh, uh, you, you want to achieve also personally, right? Uh, and possibly in alignment with that person, you need to have uh, a, a passion for something because if you don't have passion, you don't have the fire uh, in moments of difficulties and adaptation to actually push through uh, life and, and all of that. But then you need to, you know, uh, learn skills. For example, one thing that I'm doing is to learn a little bit right now, a little bit of, of um, coding and, and uh, you know, the, the language of computers and, and programming, not because I'm going to program anything, uh, but because I need to learn a little bit of the logic that is behind the artificial intelligence and all that if I want to be in dialogue, in conversation with. And if I don't have, uh, you know, the ABC at least to understand the mentality, the mindset behind uh, certain transformation, I will be left out. And it's, and it's a huge effort. It's not an effort to start in code. Um, it's just an effort to, to stay up to date. I, I, I told you that I'm part of a mastermind with young people who are amazing in digital marketing King right now. I'm sort of the uncle, right? But I'm the oldest one, the only one with, with gray hair. But I, it's, I consider myself pretty, pretty, pretty modern and, and flexible and also smart, but it takes me a lot of psychological effort just to stay behind uh, how fast and how quick these people are thinking and implementing, right? So, so yeah, that's, I think, the world we are facing. Wow. So, it, you know, especially coming from an educational institution as well for part of my work and looking at what is knowledge. So there's knowledge in the academy and we talked about the local knowledge all over the streets that we see and that there's a newer appreciation for different types of knowledge. It's becoming more, more widespread, more well-known that the educational institutions have a lot of knowledge, but they don't own the only knowledge. So it's really about learning how to learn because how do you have that yeah. excitement and little children have in like getting something new and watching how you can see their brains tick so with all of this thinking and innovation and learning how to learn and being observant in a whole different way, you mentioned Sharma, I'm thinking about Theory U and how do you really be observant about what's going on and observant in a way that's beyond your normal frame of how you see things. Looking at the world of conflict resolution, of peace building, of conflict transformation that Colombia has been going through and a lot of places are, how do you apply some of these frameworks and thinking this massive transformation of and purpose to that we, we, yeah I, I i really think that we need to incorporate technology and innovation more and more in our way of thinking because uh it will dictate dictate also uh solutions and ideas on how to solve conflicts conflicts arise many times around control of some sort of resources right or 
uh, yeah, that's you know, or, or or some sort of interest and and an idea really of scarcity, right? Uh, we have a scarcity of water, or we have a scarcity uh, of 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 livelihood, and right, some stuff like that. Now, technology will resolve a lot of those problems, right? Uh, and and, uh, and and therefore, I, I do think that. Uh, the power will shift more and more to those people who actually provide a uh, solution that are uh, coming from technology. Because, you know, I, I to tell you just a little experiment we, we are doing in, uh, in Medellin, and you know that one, one of the things that I'm focusing on right now, even just in terms of research, is, okay, this world of in technology, entrepreneurship, and all these opportunities that are coming, what, what impact can it do in marginal areas that have been touched by conflict and violence and marginalization? Um, and so, uh, like two weeks ago, we had a very interesting lunch in, um, in Medellin between two innovation entrepreneurs uh, who have a membership company um, in the United States, they had it successfully for, for several years. And a group of kids uh, from, from the uh, marginal uh, neighborhoods who have been actually very good at Facebook ads, but promoting uh, here, we call it brujeria. So they, they were playing basically to be sort of shamans and, you know, and convince you to send us the, the gold and the and the chains and, and and in exchange for them to free you from any kind of anxiety or love problems or whatever right and they were really skilled make a lot of money uh creating this reality from the neighborhoods in medellin in the united states so the idea that we came up with this interpreter is why we don't use these skills they are so good at selling they are so good at facebook ads why we don't apply to a business that is legitimate, that is legal, that can even bring them more money and and uh, and actually contribute because membership is about, you know, it's, it's basically a membership to help family who have then a loss to pay for all the funeral halls and, and, and transportation and, 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 and all of that. Um, and, and, and they are starting working for this company next week, right? So you see that there is a change where you don't even have to tell these kids, hey, you know, this is illegal, you shouldn't do it. No, because these kids have families, you know, they have dreams, they have needs, and they do what's most convenient. And if society doesn't offer them something that is convenient from something that is more legitimate and legal, right, well, you know, they will find other ways because they're ambitious and they're smart and they're quick. We will see how it goes, right? But here you go. You know, this is just a very small experiment that we are doing. It's a beta, but it could become really massive where you can learn very quickly without having to spend, you know, years and years in a university and paying a lot of money. But if you learn some technical skills like coding, for example, you can work internationally from your home uh, in, 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 with a laptop. Having skills and having a decent decent work that no, you know, normal quote unquote company would would probably provide you. So that would be one way to solve the social justice gap that there is by empowering from knowledge and from from uh, economy these kids and and helping them to change identity. Not because it's something good to do, but it's something that is more convenient for them. And I think that that's. That can be a, you know, that's just an example of how technology opportunities today are opening up possibilities that until now we didn't even think in, in the space of peace building. Yeah, that's great. Because I know that there is a very big dependency on external resources and yeah. that social entrepreneurship has always been a challenge, but some people are very good at it. So taking that skill set, you know, it's like when you see drug dealers on the corner who really are quick with math and they can do lots of different things take that skill set and put it into something legitimate. So in fact, one of these kids, you know, they're very good at selling. Uh, and um, he, you know, they were understanding that the model is, hey, some someone in your family dies and you might not have the money for the funeral, you know, might have the money to, you know, bring the, the, the body to the country of origin and all of that. So one of these kids say, yeah, 
you should sell, we should tell to these people, hey, your mom is about to die and you are not ready. <laughs> right? Which was, <laughs> which was a great slogan, you know, uh, really yeah. great marketing, you know, so buy this membership, $20 a month and, uh, yeah. and you're taking care um, of your family, right? I love so, it. Are you ready? <laughs> That's your really mom good. Is dying and you're not ready. Mm. On many different levels. So I'm just going to go to, before we go to the question, actually, I just want to ask you, how did you, how did your background and your different experiences lead you to doing what you're doing now? Well, you know, for for, for me, uh, because you mentioned before that I started out as a journalist um, and, and really journalism, besides the fact that I always like communicating and, and, you know, I always like technology and, and, uh, radio and tv that was 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 available back in in, in the days uh, when i was growing up but beside that i think i used always journalism strategically because it was a way for me to enter into world and get in touch with stories but otherwise because of my because i don't have a particular uh, you know last name or social status back right in in uh, with my family it was a way of approaching stories and people personalities and worlds that, that I was interested in. And, and, and I think that exposed me to a lot of worlds and to a lot of stories and and uh, and everything else actually is spun out of there because, you know, I, I, I met Luca Orlando, who is certainly still today one of my mentors and, and inspiring people, someone who from politics as a mayor of Palermo transformed the city of Palermo fighting against the mafia using very innovative strategies um you and i met him several times together went even together to palermo uh, but i would have not had access to him to his story and to the possibility of working with him without journalism right so and and it also developed this this, this idea of starting to observe to understand to listen uh, and then to you know synthesize and, and write about it and communicate so it was a fantastic school for um for what i do today and then i entered you know, the world of conflict resolution. And, and in the world of conflict resolution, while I was dealing with perpetrators and, and uh, facilitating uh, peace talks and ceasefire talks in, in here in Colombia, the question really came to me, wow, these people have developed an identity by becoming who they are as, as members of paramilitary groups, drug dealers and, and guerrilla leaders. How do you change an identity? Because I, the intuition that I had at one point was that unless there's a shift in identity in these people, there will be no really change. They might sign a document, but it, it's 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 not going to happen. And and that brought me into a world of you know positive psychology, uh, personal development, leadership development, and and today that's mainly what I what I do because I still and it it, it, it tracks back to Palermo. You know, I still strongly believe that it is a change in your mindset and in your mental map that then you know will also show a change outside in in the world but we need to uh believe think uh, feel differently if you want to create different realities yeah that's pretty hard to let go of an identity especially when you've yeah. had it for so long and you don't know what's next and that's it's transition and very it's frightening. frightening right so uh, that's that's um but it's possible you know that was really my question was is it possible and then i you know i went into all those disciplines and i realized that's really what people do you know that's what mandela uh did right he changed his framework because he thought that apartheid would be resolved in a certain way and then you know he changed and uh and and he created an amazing amazing effect in his own country so all these great leaders had you know, a, a specific yeah. mindset and a mind map that they changed over time. When you're in a conflict situation and somebody is your enemy and then your identity is attached to that person being your enemy, talking about peace and shifting that relationship because it's your identity in relation to other identities as well. Yeah. Very challenging. Totally. Totally. So I want to get to some of the questions. They look interesting here. So one is that it sounds like much potential here relies on collective imagination. Mm. and creating spaces where unanticipated connections can be made. I love that collective imagination. Right. Are there ways you recommend building community around or inviting others to share one's massive transformative purpose? Or is this something that happens naturally as you move through the world? It's a very beautiful question. First of all, mm -hmm. yeah, collective imagination is something that I 
really like, you know, and I was mentioning to this group of leaders, we are working together. And really, the question mm -hmm. we pose to ourselves is what is Medellin's uh, massive transformative purpose today? And, you know, and, and because uh, the city has lost it because cities change and times change. And, and so, uh, but that's really the question it, it all started. Um, yeah, and I, and I think that today a purpose, a massive transformative purpose, is also the organizing principle around which then a community can coalition, right? And uh, where you then, you know, people with different skills, uh, different experiences, but with a common shared purpose and shared values come together uh, to give a contribution to that purpose, right? Um, and there will be many, many, many contribution in order to help that problem to be solved. It doesn't have to be just one solution, right? Uh, but certainly that helps the connection, that helps uh, the, the, the feeling, the connections, the conversations, and the sharing of solution and knowledge. So in that sense, yes, I think that uh, the massive transformative purpose is the, the, the organizing principle. It's, it's like to say, hey, this is the horizon towards which we want to wanna walk, no? Uh, and it, I think it happens both naturally as well as help through through organizations. Uh, but probably at the beginning, it's more organic rather than say, hey, let's sit down and, and plan things. Uh, if you have this passion for a purpose, it becomes almost impossible not to communicate with something, someone. It's not something you keep secret. Uh, and then you will see how it resonates. And th with the people who are resonating, you will discover suddenly that other people are thinking alike or are trying uh, to, to resolve the same problem. And that then creates, you know, the synergies in the community. Nice. Nice response, too, to that beautiful question. Okay. That helps with a beautiful question. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get the right question. All right. Now there is uh, an interesting question here, Marissa from Indonesia. In the midst of this unpredictable digital era, how can we prevent the technology to negatively impacting humanity? People are concerned about that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a, it's a concern that comes up right uh, constantly, and uh, also in this group we are working together. There are some people that are resisting the idea of technology. And many times it is also because we are not so familiar with technology. So what, what is unknown to us, it, it's a little bit scary. And also we might see more negative application of technology than, than, than positively in, in our mainstream conversations, right? Um, and not to say that, you know, even very relevant people, Elon Musk comes to, to mind, are actually telling us that artificial intelligence is going to be very, very dangerous as well. But it doesn't depend on the technology in itself. It really depends on what is the level uh, and the quality of our consciousness, right? And so, and that's where our part comes in, right? Uh, at the end, I think that um, my consciousness, uh, if I'm dormant or awakened, uh, will determine how I will use the technology. Yeah, you know, uh, just to make a... Um, is the example chat gpt is there for everyone to to be used it really depends what is my prompt uh, that determines what chat gpt what kind of information chat gpt is going to give me right so uh, what what is the quality of my intention and the quality of my intention comes from the quality of my consciousness so that's why i think that we need to work together right in developing not only the technology but really also you know, the collective, coming back to that term, collective consciousness of, of, of people and making sure that we use technology for the good. Technology is, is neutral in a certain sense, right? Even though we could debate that, but and um, it really depends on, on our quality as, as humans. What, where do we direct the use of this technology? It has always been like that, right? Uh, print uh, came out to print the Bible, but then it was also used or awful stuff, right? So it really depends on the intention. Reminds me of the expression we use a lot, which is self as instrument of change. And so we talk to students and others about the better quality you are. And then what, as soon as you enter into a situation, you're bringing a better quality of what could happen. So just by showing up in a certain way, you're already shifting the dynamics in that space, making it a collective space. So what, then it what I sorry just just to add on that, but what I would say today is uh not a question is 
if I'm going to interact with technology or not. I don't think we have the luxury of that choice. Uh, today, we have to deal and to relate with technology and actually to get to know technology. We cannot just stay out of it just because, oh, it's scary or I don't know mm -hmm. it. Or, no, because uh, technology will just eat us up. And and if we are not able to understand and relate to it and start thinking it as a component that is vital of our lives, we will also not be able to make meaningful contribution to the world, right? So uh, it's not an option today. You know, do I want to use a technology or not? Like, you know, do I want to go walking or, or take a bus or a car? No, you 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 will have to uh, know technology today. Yeah. So if they say that people are the we give the input to the technology. So if technology is neutral, then people give the input. So we're also shaping artificial intelligence. We're giving our input. So the quality of who we are and what we give. Now, the scary part for, you know, you look at a lot of different sci-fi movies and books and so on, and some of the conversations taking place are, but then technology will take on a life of its own. And then technology, because machine learning is so much faster than human learning, that it's going to take off and be smarter than humans. And then there's a lot of fear about that. So I'm wondering, is that substantial? Can we substantiate what that is? Or... Is it that we are afraid of the change and afraid of the unknown, or maybe a combination of both? Yeah, it's probably a combination of both. And, and that's a very possible scenario, right? The question today in people that are very futuristic thinking, you know, it's at one point will machine have a conscious, you know? And and once it has, you know, what, what, what will happen, right? And, uh, and it works in a, such a way that it self-develops itself. So it's not even... A matter of you know humans creating that, um, but you mentioned science fiction, and, and I think that one way to start um, changing our mindset uh, is actually to read in science fiction. And I say it because it's not something that I like to do, uh, but I started to do just just to be you know in tune with the with the times. And you know Elon Musk, everything he does, it, it came out actually an idea from an idea of reading science fiction uh, books, right? So today, science fiction is becoming the plan for what might become real, right? So learning to think about how how um, a science fiction writer author creates stories, you know, uh, how they think uh, might also help us to be very imaginative, individually and collectively, of what solution do we know? Because that's really what we need to come. We need to imagine a future without thinking about how we are going to realize that, because otherwise we are just perpetrating and basing everything on the knowledge that is already there. So it will be more of the same with some adjustment. Today, we need to be very creative and say, this is what I want to create. This is the world that I want to live in. And then from that point of view, you know, saying, okay, now what skills do I need to believe uh, to 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 uh, to create to to grow? You know, what do I need to learn? What knowledge do we don't have and we need to have in order for this reality to be true? That that's that's really you know we need to live our lives and and also I think design our careers and everything else we do from this future that we want to uh, hopefully you know generate and and uh, and be part of. Great. So um, I am going to ask you in a little while for some tips and recommendations you may have about how people can do some of that. One I know you said is read sci-fi, try to expand uh, yeah. your thinking. But here's another question, and we'll get back to that after. I think a lot of the fear around AI being used in conflict is more so around the fact that large militarized states have the most advanced technology and the power to wield it. How can we avoid technology being used to reinforce existing power imbalances? And that happened because a lot of the resources and the money for research was concentrated in those agglomerates, right? Um, I'm not sure that's going to be always in the case. You know, uh, there was a Peter Thiel, which is a quite interesting guy in Silicon Valley, certainly a, a, a big visionary, controversial guy, but he wrote an interesting introduction uh, to a book in the 90s where he was saying that the conflict in the future will be between the crypto people and more of the intelligence, artificial intelligence people, because that's more 
concentrating, right, in the crypto world. Meaning, you know, today we see the cryptocurrency and the Bitcoin because that's going to be a very more anarchic, decentralized kind of world, right? And I think that the possibilities that technology will give us is that less and less we will need the state as 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 we experience it today, you know, and more and more we will be able to create our own communities to which we want to be a part of and that will provide, you know, services and everything that we, we will need. So I think that the relevance of the state is, 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 is going to come down also because the relevance of the territory uh, will be less, right? Uh, you know, that's not going to happen overnight and tomorrow, but my guess would be that that is the, that is the trend. You know, there's already people, uh, I have been talking to a few of them this past week, that are basically just already living in uh, super nation kind of worlds where we are part of communities that are uh, international and uh, they have their own coin and they have their own businesses and and they they, they just live in a parallel world that also communicates with this, um, but around a purpose and around values, you know, and and you know over time that might substitute you know the state and the heavy state uh, like we like we uh, like we see today like we experience it today the state in the past was conceived as the source of the solutions right and uh, for the economy for health for education so it was a heavy heavy state but also with technology innovation that will be less and less possible but also because the state takes a lot of time to um to catch up <laughs> with everything that is happening. So the world will be faster than states and states will become less relevant. And, you know, we'll see what what, what that looks like, but it's going to be interesting. It is interesting that's happening already when you think about um, when there are wars, it's state against state, but you have over the years now non-state actors and you have different kinds of groups that cross national boundaries. So it's a whole different way of framing and dealing and making peace accords. And and actually, you know that that's also in terms of conflict resolution and security will be really a big challenge. Uh, you know, uh, we we see that tragically on both sides right now. What's happening in with Israel and and Hamas, right? But it's really, you know, Hamas has a territory and doesn't, right? So so what does it mean, you know, to get rid of Hamas? It's really questionable, right? Uh, with the categories and the ideas that we had before, but. You can see a state how a state is thinking and how much more agile with technology and everything uh, a terrorist group can 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 work today, right? Um, so so yeah, it, it, this everything will not be used only by good people. You know the, the fact that you know there will be lots of very beautiful communities like there is already a lot of very beautiful communities. You know every time we go to an international conference on peace building and community building. That's you know a, a transnational community that comes together and does wonderful things. And with technology, I think we will be able to do even more bigger things. But at the same time, there are other meetings going on uh, that are more deadly as a, as a, as a purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so another comment is to a suggestion about maybe reconsidering that technology is news neutral, especially when you think about chat GPT and it's cute, it's skewed because of how it was created on Western textual sources, inherently unable to take into account oral non-Western traditions so that it's already a replication of what is in the world. So is it really neutral? Yeah, that, that, that's, that's why I say, you know, let's say neutral, it was more for the sake of the, the time in the end of conversation, but it's in in uh, in in uh, yeah, it's it's not to take it as a, as, a, as a dogma because for now it's not neutral at all, right? Uh, definitely, but but it will, you know, it 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 will change in that sense because it will be made richer. I already see, for example, uh, engineers working on models that come from studying. Uh, ancestral tradition and cultures, you know, and 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 taking that into into account in in uh, information, in technology, in health. So it it will change as we participate more and more in in this conversation, right? Uh, and that's also why we have to be in because 
if if only a certain group of people are going to be part of this, then it will reflect that group of people. That's one more reason, I think, in order not to stay out of the conversation with technology today. Right. So giving different kinds of input that is more inclusive with a broader range of points of view yeah. will only enhance the quality of the technology as well. Okay, so another question here is about, what's your opinion about how technology AI would help close culture gaps during conflict resolution? Would technology help enemies reach common ground as it influences the way we consume information and the way we check facts? I, I, I think it could be very useful in changing perception. Uh, it, it can be used to enhance capacity for empathy. Uh, you know, there's an interesting uh, uh, experiment that they have done with students uh, of a business school in Stanford, and they created a virtual reality uh, where students could uh, interact with homeless people in, in San Francisco and, and be in touch uh, with that reality. And and that really changed the perception of the problems in, uh, in the students, right? Uh, now, you're in Stanford, you could say, hey, why do you need virtual reality? You could just go down the street in San Francisco, San Francisco and right. be differently, you know, uh, like I guess Columbia with Harlem. But the, 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 the possibility of actually experimenting the other's point of view and the other experience will be uh, strongly enhanced, for example, by, you know, virtual reality. Uh, and, and it could help. Uh, could help in creating scenarios. Uh you know, with with uh, I, I have to say that uh, this program at Columbia University has been quite cutting edge from this point of view because already, I don't know, with Mark we look like fifteen years ago. Uh, we're already, you know, with the technology lab at uh, Columbia University, which was uh, headed by a very visionary guy who unfortunately died, right, Frank Moretti. But they they, they had created a simulation to prevent genocide. Uh, yeah. Which was based completely on like country X created by yeah yeah with yeah. country X and uh, and it was for a course in in genocide prevention uh, you know it was really forward thinking you think uh, uh, on behalf of the program back then so yeah, yeah it's so, definitely help making decisions yeah, so decision. yeah I think uh, one of the underlying principles we're talking about here is the idea about getting outside of your own mindset and being able to expand your mindset, interact with others. We do that in the program and elsewhere. People go out in the field, right? We do field work. It's very much an important part of the program. It's an important part of what people do. You need to interact with others and traveling. Sometimes we can't. So that's when also technology plays a role to make things possible that may not be possible either. It's interesting. I'm, I, I'm sure there are technologies that also simulate the sounds and smells of places. I know one of the things I notice when I travel, you go someplace, it just smells different because the foods are different. The hygiene is different. Everything is different in a place. I remember many years ago traveling in, on a motorcycle. Not that that's my favorite form of transportation, but I remember smelling the onions in the field you know, or the flowers in the field. So getting those different kinds of visceral realities as well does expand. And then when you see the day-to-day -day life, so you're talking about the scenarios. And then if we're trying to understand the situation and make recommendations to change a situation, we can only do so with the input that we have. So how do you continue to expand? And that talks about some of the people ask questions about broadening perspective, different kind of culture gaps and so on. So I wonder, you know, what's your opinion about is the world getting smaller in the sense of being able to have technology and have access to similar or shared information on a more regular basis? Does that bring people closer together in their perceptions and mindsets? I, I, I think you probably, you know, I don't have the data. We would have need data to say something that is more specific. I can go only anecdotal, but I can tell you that the technology has helped even some of our friends uh, that we know that, that come from disadvantaged starting points, socially, economically speaking, that thanks to the technology, um, were able to open up their mind to other possibilities and then created those possibilities for themselves and others. And I'm not talking just the most recent technology. I'm talking about when, when uh, uh, VHS uh, came to 
the tapes, you know, uh, came to before VCR came to to the barrios in Medellin, and people started uh, understanding what hip hop and rap is and what the strength is about that, and that revolutionized the life of many neighborhoods, right? So that that's an opening of your uh, cultural maps. That's an integration, right? And you know, and, and today I see a lot of adolescents, and maybe they spend too much time in video games instead of and in their uh, rooms instead of going out and also you know, socializing with their surroundings. Uh, but I find it interesting that we are talking with people and having friends all around the world and, and getting inputs and experiences from all around the world. I, I think that's that's also very, very interesting in that in that sense. So I, I do think we have uh, bigger possibilities today. But I, I go back to what I said at the beginning. We need a, a, an intention that makes sense. Uh, because otherwise we will end up being overwhelmed by by all of this. But if we have a massive transformative purpose, which means you know something really you want to contribute to the world, and then you take into the fact of that technology is an essential part and will be more and more an essential part, whether we like it or not, of our lives and our solutions, then you really, I think, prepare yourself for the future, right? Um, and and uh, uh, and you will have a meaningful life and, uh, you know, and you will be with people who share also your purpose and want to do good in the world in ways that can be potentially, you know, much more scalable and effective in terms of solution than uh, in uh, years past. Right. So, uh, you know, I, I I was in Austria now I'm researching a little bit the life of my grandfather, who was a major leader of the armed resistance against Hitler. And uh, it, very interesting, the little, the no technology they had, you know, and 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 I was thinking, you know, what had would have my grandfather be able to do with the technology in terms of communication, but also probably he saved his life because it was more difficult yeah. to intercept him, uh, because the technology was not so advanced. And today, you know, everybody knows where we are if we carry our cell phones on our bodies. So that's right. Yeah, it's a. Uh, it's a world that is changing, but uh, but I think it's also exciting. I I would invite people to to approach it not with fear, with a fear that blocks. It can be approached with skepticism, but also with curiosity, right? And and, and trying to understand what's really going on. And I remember that somebody told a story about when he first heard the first cassette tape of hip hop music yeah. from New York changed his life. And I remember relaying that story to other people and they were less surprised about the change than they were about what do you talk, what is a cassette tape? <laughs> yeah, right. And then I realized that dated me. So, yeah. so a couple of things <laughs> I've captured from what you said, Aldo, about how people can start to prepare themselves. So one is reading sci-fi, reading things that expand your mind, expand your way of thinking. Another is to have an attitude of some skepticism and curiosity what else would you recommend for people to start to do to be able to take on this transformation? I would I would uh, follow uh, you know YouTube channels and and X accounts of people that come from this world of technology. Uh, for example, you know Peter Diamandis uh, is certainly one of the most uh, positive and 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 uh, ambitious thinker in this field of how to use technology for good in the world. Um, there is a great book uh, which just came out in the second, uh, you know, an updated version, uh, which is called Exponential Organizations 2.0, um, written by Peter Yamantis and Samil, Sa, Samil, can't remember his last name, never, but Peter, it's Peter Yamantis and another author, and it's uh, Exponential Organization 2.0. Uh, Highly recommend it to understand what will happen and how we can adjust uh, from a mindset point of view. Um, and probably, you know, now I say something completely on the other side of, <laughs> of the spectrum, but I think that cultivating skills like mindfulness, you know, but, but not just to calm your nerves, you know, not just to, uh, oh, I'm a little bit anxious, let me breathe deep and do 10 minutes, no. But really diving in, in, into disciplines and, and and being able to connect, you know, with the universe, you know, you can call it as you want, as you prefer, with others. Uh, I, I I think that you know will 
channel a lot of very good information to you and good intuitions that then you can use actually to do something good. And and I would combine the two things, right? I wouldn't rely only on technology as I wouldn't rely only on meditation, but I would combine more and more of the two. Uh, yesterday, I was talking to a guy who is the CEO of one of these communities. And uh, and I asked him, how is your human resources uh, department working? You know, how, how do you how do you get talent? How do you attract talent? And he says, oh, we have a group of people that are just dedicated to that. And we just meditate the entire day. And talent comes to us, right? Which I thought, that's a fascinating way of getting talent today, right? Uh, and and um, and it was not a joke. It was really their method, right? So so that's, of course, that's very deep skills and, you know, practice of meditation probably over years, right? But but, but great authors like Harari, you know, uh, he's a practitioner of Vipassana. He meditates two hours a day and then does two months a, a year before writing a book. So, you know, so I would cultivate that part as well, um, personally. Interesting. Well, they say, you know, through meditation, you change your consciousness, you change your vibrations, and then you attract different kinds of vibrations and other kinds of people. So yeah. there is some science to it also. Yeah, totally, totally, more and more, yeah. And it might look completely different than technology, but I, I, I do think that the two things go go hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, Gates meditates, you know, it's not a... Yeah, yeah. Not a, a, by chance. No. Is there anything you'd like to say in closing? We're just about at time. Something no, I think, you know, follow up with? if, if some, what, what are we taking away? I, I would say two things. Find find your massive transformative purpose. And if you don't find it, just copy it from someone. You know, you like <laughs> you like someone else's, just start somewhere. Um, and this, but, but, but dedicate time to that until you really feel it. You know, you really uh, think I'm going to dedicate my life to this. Uh, and the second part is, uh, start getting familiar, you know, with with, uh, with a world that is coming because of technology and discover the opportunities that to your purpose, technology can open up, I would say. That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, I'll meditate on that. That's wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much, Aldo. Always interesting and inspiring to have a conversation with you. Thank you so All much, right. Beth and everyone else. And I hope to see you yep. soon, even physically. Okay. In yeah, person. we will soon. And uh, thank you, everybody, for listening, participating, asking some really stimulating questions. Please stay on. David has joined us, and he will take you through anything you need to know about the program. But Aldo and I will sign off. So thank you.